I'm not a Puritan. I mean, I've, I've got many things in my life I'm not going to tell you. But when things are important, like drawing and art, you, you can't, I separate that from the mundane. You're being handed an opportunity, but you keep crawling back to, to capture and saying, hire me. I want to become, make $10 million. I want to make $7,000 a week. I want to buy these fancy pants. <laughs> Young directors that work for me, I meet them at, my, at parties lately. They got these great pants. You know, these designer pants. I know they made a lot of money, but they're doing Shrek 2, 3, and 4. <laughs> they think they're doing something. I mean, I'm sorry, guys. If you're young or half young, get a bunch of guys together and make your own films. Back in the 70s, Disney was turning out this treacle. It was, uh, you know, Aristocats, Robin Hood, uh, uh, who, who cared? And Ralph came out there and he got my generation, and by extension, your generation, interested in animation again. And it was kind of cool. I think without Ralph, animation would have actually died out. In grade school, I used to kind of, I used to doodle a lot, actually. And at that time, I didn't really know the impact my father had on actually art, I just would doodle myself and um, make little flip books and my journals and stuff for school. And I'd, and I'd ask my dad, you know, you know, how do I draw an elf? Do you know how to draw an elf? Like actually not even knowing necessarily when I was really young that he had drawn billions of elves. And Ralph was one of the few who broke through consistently making films, animated films, that were um, treated an adult ad audience like adults. So Ralph to me is probably the most significant person in the last 40 years of animation. Some people work very well with my dad. They get him, I've seen it, they love him, they get it. Some people do not work well with him, hate him. He was definitely breaking the rules and taking animation to places it had never been before. Don't do it Disney's way, you're nothing in your craft. And every Adam and I said, yes, yes, it's the only way, God, yes. God, you can't do this, yes. God said you can't do this. Our hands are tied. Why are the pictures bad, Connie? The pictures are bad because we don't have Disney's money. No, Connie, the pictures are bad because you're not thinking about what you're doing. Disney was, was dead. I mean, their films were terrible at that point. The studio was almost out of business. So we looked to ourselves as sort of the salvation, and maybe we could take animation somewhere else. You see, I'm a cartoon animation director. You mean you draw cartoon comedies for the movies? That's right. Ralph grew up dirt poor in Brownsville, Brooklyn. I didn't know I was poor. I knew we didn't have as much as we were supposed to have, but it didn't matter. Quite simply, Brownsville was a ghetto, a very Jewish, very black, very Irish, very Italian. Um, it was a very wonderful, wonderful place to grow up um, because of the different ethnic qualities to it that I enjoyed very much. The freedom of a, of a ghetto, meaning that there really was nothing we had to live up to. And we found that very important. In other words, nobody was chasing me to be a lawyer or a doctor or anything. You have that kind of freedom, you could afford to fail. And if you could afford to fail, you're never worried. Too many people are worried about losing today, what people think of them, political correctness. That'll kill an artist. You know, if you're worried about what people would think, you're never going to do heavy traffic or Fritz the Cat. I lived in a very mixed neighborhood, and never once in my house heard anything racist. Not once. Not, there wasn't a racist line said about any religion or any person. I grew up 100% clear of that. that. That also allowed me to treat people as I treat them, but it also allowed me to look at people as who they were. So Ralph just started middle school and 
Earlier in the day, he is involved in some kind of food fight in the cafeteria, and he's already in trouble with the principal. At the end of the school day, he's sitting on the steps outside of the school with his back against the front door, just smoking a cigarette. He's leaning against the door, and someone starts pushing from the inside, and Ralph gets angry, and suddenly someone just pushes with such force that the door opens and it's the principal again. So it's twice in one day with the same principal. And it's that second meeting where I try to save face, and I just told him I was a great artist. Now, where that came from and how that came, it came from reading comic books, maybe. And a light bulb goes off over the principal's head because he knows there's a technical art school that he can send kids like Ralph to, to get him out of his hair. So it was that incident that got me into art school that changed my life. So he told me where to go and I took it. <laughs> that creep. Not long after he makes the arrangements and Ralph finds himself uh, going to Manhattan for the first time in his life. Stuff sounds interesting. I always wondered how they did it. Well, maybe we can dicker a bit. How about spending a day or two at the studio? That sounds okay to me. Cosmo was one of Ralph's friends at the art high school that he attended in Manhattan. Uh, Cosmo got himself a job at Terry Tunes, which is a cartoon company in New Rochelle, New York, and in turn said, Ralph, you got to come out here and, and work. Hey, we'll make a cartoonist out of you yet. Terry Toons was a fantasy world come true for Ralph. Everywhere you went, it was art. It was cartooning before computers. You know, everywhere on the floor, thousands of drawings, thousands of women sitting there painting cells, all these great characters and inking by hand. It was, and it was a fairy tale come true. I couldn't wait to get to work. I would have paid them. So I spent years there painting and inking and everything, and I was very anxious to get to animate because I could. And I did all the work, and I'd go home every night and animate on my own. So I'm sitting there saying, I've had enough of this. I'm not waiting anymore. And uh, so I picked up my desk at lunch when nobody was around. Picked up my desk and said, I've had, I'm going downstairs, I'm going to animate. And Ralph was the only Jewish person there. You know, he was the only, he was kind of an, a little bit of an outcast, and he, he had the ability and the talent, and he was passed up several times, uh, you know, for promotion and moving ahead. Production manager comes through. He says, what are you doing here? Because he knows I belong upstairs with inkers and painters. I said, well, I'm animating. What do you mean what I'm doing here? He says, what do you mean you're animating? I said, well, I'm animating. Ask Connie. Connie was the director. I wouldn't have gone downstairs and let me animate if I could not animate. I would have kept my mouth shut. But the minute I knew I was better than most guys in the place, I went downstairs. I said, you didn't go downstairs because you're not better than anyone else yet. Terry Toons did not let directors work on the scripts, did not let directors do the storyboards, and no directors recorded the voices. So after about a year of that, I had enough. Why did you leave? Because I wasn't getting anywhere. After 18 months, I figured I was worth more than they were paying me. And I figured I was ready for promotion to more important work. And I heard that somebody um, was leaving the top job at Paramount Pictures in New York. I called someone at Paramount. I said, I'd like to inquire about the job. He says, come on down. And after an hour and a half of talk with him, he hired me. And they gave me Paramount Cartoon Studios to run at, I don't know, 25, 26, I don't know. So I, I get to the elevator and I'm shaking because I got a whole place to run. And I'm young and I'm very scared. So I'm afraid he's going to come out of his office and change his mind. So I run down all the 44 floors. Animators don't have to be crazy, but it helps. If you don't like the way things are done, you can spend a lot of time complaining about it. That was Walter's usual way. But this time, he got an idea. So Ralph was in New York, and 
he knew this producer, Steve Krantz, and he was telling Krantz, I want to make a feature film, and I've got the script right here. Ralph had Heavy Traffic, which ended up being his second feature he had already written an outline for. And Steve Krantz said, no, you've got to produce an existing property. So at the same time, uh, underground uh, comics were breaking out. Uh, Robert Crumb, of course, is the author of Fritz the Cat. And Ralph picked up the Fritz collection at the bookstore, and he put it on Steve Krantz's desk and said, let's make this then. Ralph hit a grand slam with this film, his first feature film. For Ralph, it was another stepping stone towards getting to produce the kind of pictures he really wanted to produce. I was sick and tired of the cartoons they were making. I didn't find what they were trying to say any reason to say. So I immediately thought that anything different would get people excited. Most studios other than Disney didn't have a production arm in animation. They didn't have this sort of system set up where you can plug into it like they have today. So when he came and said, I'm going to make an animated film, they said, great. So Ralph made three urban films, three street pictures, and we hadn't seen a glimpse of his interest in fantasy worlds yet. I went to Wizards because my pictures before that, Coonskin, Heavy Traffic, Fritz the Cat, Hey Good Looking, the fights were, look, let, let me clear something up in this heroic business. The fights were incredibly hard. Uh, studios are ready to sue me for all kinds of reasons, degeneracy, anything they could make up, and it was only by a hair breadth that they decide not to. Artists have been, you know, doing this for as long as time. Uh, artists have been uh, ridiculed, have been praised for their opinions and their visions. And um, I think that, uh, you know, Ralph is no different. So the point is, I wanted to make something that would keep me excited. Because being bored at your art form is not a good thing. He drew what he saw. He drew the reality of things around him. He is not worried about um, offending people. My films have been around for 30, 40 years. People are rediscovering them each five, four years in colleges, and they, they are stunned. I'm a professor at a university, and we show, look to show his films in class. And um, sometimes the students will react. I mean, they all love it, but sometimes we, we get hesitant. You know, the program director says, I don't know if you should show this, this, this you know, this R-rated slash X-rated movie. Uh, you know, they all have respect for my dad, but there's still, there's always that little bit. It's the only kind of film where it's like, those films, heavy traffic, you know, you have to think twice before you view it. Was I ahead of my time? No. Everyone else is behind. I'm not ahead. I'm doing what's right for an artist. He's doing what he believes in. It's not ahead of my times. What I am is honest. What they are is dishonest. <laughs> He was never trying to prove a point. He was never trying to show people anything or demonstrate a huge idea. He was just trying to show what is. He always said that his stories are, he was the quiet guy in the corner just watching. Of course, I loved fantasies. Then I read Lord of the Rings. I went nuts. I mean, it was 
probably the greatest fantasy for realism. Here's a, Tolkien is so brilliant, so great. Um, here's a totally believable world he put together. You know, every page, detail on what they're eating and how they look and how they feel. I've never read anything like it in my whole life to this date. So I went into his office and a woman asked if I had an appointment. I said, no. She said, well, you can't see Danny. He came walking off the street. I said, just tell him Ralph Bakshi is here with the rights to Lord of the Rings. She says, what? She, she grumbled and she growled and she finally did it. She does it, the door swings open, he comes storming out of his office. You got what, Ralph? So Ralph would just basically, you know, go into um, the st studio executive's office, pitch an idea, and they would, you know, they would green light it many times off his pitch. And then they fired Dan Melnick next week. And this guy, Dick Shepard, comes in. Shepard calls me into his office, he says, Lord of the what? I say, well, Lord of the Rings, we have a deal. He says, I don't want to make that stupid picture. I said, oh, you don't want to give me my rights back. He says, we don't want to give you your rights back. So I said, why don't you take your $100,000 back? Would you give me the rights? He says, yeah, I'll do it if you give me back the $100,000. I said, oh, yeah. I mean, this picture made billions of dollars years later. And these are, the, these are the kind of geniuses you have in Hollywood, right? I do think that he was lucky. I think he was lucky in a lot of situations. When you hear his entire life story, he's got he's been in so many situations, like walking into an elevator, walking into a coffee shop, things roll, somebody, you know, somebody's like, hey, all right, I'll fund your film, all right. Um, I called him and told him I had the rights. What do you want to do this film with me? He said, absolutely. So he flew down the next day. And we made a deal with Zentz to do Lord of the Rings. One of the first questions I asked about film production is, how much? Well, <laughs> how long is a piece of string? A motion picture is not a stock or inventory item that can cost surprisingly little or involve a budget that would choke an elephant. <laughs> It was a point in my life where I had read it in high school and all my friends had read it and when, the, when um, word got out that he was doing it, it was, you know, people were incredibly excited um, and they were also warning me that he better get it right. <laughs> I read about Variety that they were planning to do it and I had been in love with the books for several years and uh, I actually had an uncle that was a uh, I don't know, vice president or something at Universal, and I said, do you know these people? Or is there any way you can get me to meet them? And he didn't know them, but he knew people that knew people. So he was able to uh, help me get an interview with Ralph. The Lord of the Rings is in many ways like a scholarly edition of a work of medieval literature, such as Tolkien would have studied. Uh, how do you get that across on screen? The choices have to be made, and the full depth is something that uh, is unlikely ever to be uh, accessible from the screen. He hired me not originally to write the screenplay, but just to do research to say what the costume should look like or what the characters would be doing at a certain time. So I was able to get a, you know, a job. He wouldn't, you know, I was an unknown, so he didn't hire me off the street to be the screenwriter. <laughs> I think it's pretty clever the way you fellows combine cartoon figures with something that looks as real as that automobile. We've made tracing some photographs of a real car for those scenes. How is he going to take this unbelievably complex undertaking of Lord of the Rings and get a finished film for whatever budget Saul Sands gave him to do it with, which I suspect wasn't enough? And what is rotoscope? Rotoscope is where you shoot live action and you produce photographs from the live action frame by frame. If you put these photographs on an animator's desk and have them draw over the photographs, you now have a pencil drawing of the drawn photograph. When you flip the pencil drawing, it's gonna move just like the photograph, more or less. Uh, well, the rotoscoping technique of, uh, of, of actually uh, hand drawing over live action uh, really allowed the film to have a look, a really special look to it, this really fluid movement look that, um, and allowed 
allowed the film to have realistic movement on, on characters like horses or battles. You can't animate that realistically. You can't. From pure imagination, you can't. It's impossible. Um, so I decided to shoot the whole movie. I said, my God, this is, this is the only way to do it. Once I, once I decided that, I knew I could do the movie. Aragorn. Aragorn, go to Minas Tirith. Save my people. The Boromir's death is one of the, you know, if you think about it, it's an animated scene, but it, it, it feels like a live action film, the subtlety of it, the, the, the camera work. I uh, talked to Raph about solarizing the film, you know, and, and process it to lab. And when you solarize film, it, it, it looks almost like a drawing, you know. It's a technique that you expose a film to light while it's being processed. But it has to be just so much light, and it has to be timed just right. But it does give a good effect, and of course, it saved a lot of pr problems in, in the battles, you know, with all these people in Madrid. I think that ultimately what Bakshi showed was that the Lord of the Rings could be tackled cinematically, and it could be done in a way without Disneyfying Tolkien. Uh, it showed that fantasy and fairy tale were serious adult enterprises. There are 3,000 people in costume, all stationed and positioned. There are eight cameras ready to roll, right? It took me all morning to set up, and they're all out there, and it's cold. And I finally get the camera one ready, camera two ready, camera three, and everything's positioned on a bullhorn, right? And I'm saying, roll camera one. Each camera starts to roll, eight cameras, because you don't want to miss the action from every angle. You know what I mean? You don't want to. Um, and this communist leader who's running the entire thing stands up and says, lunch. And everybody stands up in costume, drops their swords, and walks away. I was out of my mind. It was also on a budget, it's all screaming at me. You know, you, producers always worrying up. So, you know, it's, this is, these are hard shots. It was more a labor of love, you know. Uh, and and Raf uh, created that with you. You know, he wasn't bossy boss. I mean, he, he was, he did look out after everybody, and you knew that. And you knew how, how deeply he felt about it. And after a while, you got involved in it, and it became a part of you. You know, the amount of work to produce rings, the frames, the people, shooting live action and animation, I mean, I don't think anyone ever appreciated I was on the verge of insanity. In other words, that was so much work for one man to be doing as a director. It wasn't where someone else shot the live action and said, I was over Spain shooting major live action footage. I had 3,000 people in the studio back in New York animating. I'm fielding 500 calls a day from the problems in the studio. I'm shooting an entire live action movie, and I'm trying to eat dinner with Zens at night, who wants to be talked to. I'm saying, so after a couple of years of that, I was pretty much a basket case. We were working seven days a week, 12 hours a day. We'd literally leave at eight at night when it was getting dark and say, okay, I'll see you at sunrise. And you'd come back the next day and you'd work and you'd work and you'd drink coffee. And a lot of people drawing, throwing things away. Drawing, not good, throwing things away. My dad would walk around and they would be like, wah! And he'd talk to them and they'd draw, no, try this, try this. And I remember I would just walk around and be like, oh, you're so mean, you're so mean. That was a good drawing. And they'd be like, here, kid, you have the drawing. Hobbit hair. I got, I got fired once for because somebody did a lousy job on Hobbit hair, and they thought it was my scene, and I got fired, and of course I was devastated. For several months I was doing research, and then I wrote the script for him. I wrote five pages of the script, just to give him, you know, hint, hint, this is what I've done for a few years, this is what I'm good at. And so he finally gave me the shot. We'd give people a break because he needed to, he would do it on a whim, or he genuinely liked something and he would take a chance. I can't tell you how many people he promised would be his next director during the course of the film. That was his big thing, you'll be my next director.
Mick Jagger, who always wanted to play Frodo, but I, I found out later that's why he really came up. But when Nick Dragon came, really came up and walked through the studio, the girls went crazy. No one could talk. Everybody was shaking. People were running into hallways screaming. You had just thundering hooves, people running up and down the stairwells trying to get to see him. And it was bedlam. The management eventually threw Backstreet Productions out. <laughs> Family never took second place to my filmmaking. Um, if I'm a filmmaker and I'm working very hard, you bring the family to the office and crawl around the floor. If you want to see your kids and you can't get home at night, bring them up. It's your family. Who? What else you got? <laughs> I mean, you got a car. You got a car. You got a dog. You got your family. That's it. You know. Because he threw me right in there. He. Um... He didn't, uh, he didn't kind of warn me. I just showed up on set and he said, Mark, you're gonna go do this. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, go over there. You have to take the camera crew. Here are the storyboards. I went, get me these angles. And um, I might've been 17. He brought us in for voices. He brought his father in for voices. He just does a lot of voices. With I ran my own company. We didn't have budgets big enough to hire all the people that I would have needed to cover me. So Liz came in and took care of all the business. I don't have to bother with it. She wasn't ever telling me, like the, everyone else was, to be more commercial. She fought for me to continue to do exactly what I felt right or wrong. I'd be dead if it wasn't for her. I mean, I'd be a drug addict or gone. It's another story, so. He's taken his perseverance for film and really transferred it into his art. Uh, you know, when I go up to, vi to visit him, I, he's, he's on top of the mountain, you know, painting nonstop. He's in, his, he's in his studio painting all day, comes out for dinner, goes back in there, paints, you know, goes to sleep, wakes up, paints more. And One thing I noticed Ralph had a lot of was perseverance when faced with obstacles. Nothing seemed to steer him off course. If you're an artist, if you have something you wrote, you directed, you produced in your own company, something you truly have to make, perseverance is easy. You sit there crying about getting a job at Disney or things are falling apart. The same thing the old animators were doing when I was a kid. It's all crumbling. It's not crumbling. You're crumbling. What I tell people about Ralph is whether you like Ralph or hate Ralph, whether you like Ralph's films or hate Ralph's films, he made eight films in 10 years exactly how he felt like it. He didn't do focus groups. He didn't care what the marketing people said. He did what he wanted to do, and I think that's why he was successful. He got people to give him money to make animation when nobody gave a shit about animation. So perseverance is something you get if you're doing something you truly love. And perseverance is something you don't have if you don't care about what you're doing. You think I would have gone to the extent I went with people and finding them if I didn't care about the films? Mm -hmm.